First on Radio 4, after days of rioting and looting in English cities, the police have warned that far-right extremists could exploit the tensions by introducing a violent racial element. In the report this week, James Silver examines some of the growing tensions that lie behind that warning. After Anders Breivik's mass murder in Norway, the Prime Minister ordered the security services to report back on the threat posed by far-right extremists. After such a dreadful event, the British government must, of course, review our own security at home, and that is what the National Security Council started to do this morning. The massacre in Norway was fueled in part by a deep-seated fear of the spread of Islam. On the report this week, we visit two hotspots in Britain with large Muslim populations. People are feeling very intimidated, but they sit here and they say Islamic rules enforced in this Sharia control zone. That's what they're saying. We ask whether the English Defence League is right to claim that if ignored by mainstream politics, that fear could turn some individuals into terrorists. This is a dangerous scenario I'm talking about. Unless you give a platform to people's angers and frustrations, then it can go any way. And we hear how ironically, some say the failure of the far right to gain a foothold in the political process represents a threat to Britain's Muslims. There are good reasons to be watching because where you don't have a successful far-right party, levels of racially and religiously motivated violence tend to be higher. I'd first like to welcome everyone to this press conference entitled Oslo Today, London Tomorrow, the Sharia is Unstoppable. We have with us Just a week after 77 people were murdered in Norway, a radical Islamic group are holding a press conference in East London. The current climate in Europe has undoubtedly changed to one of hostility and aggression towards the Muslim community. Europe is at boiling point and the bombings in Oslo showed to what extent some individuals and groups are willing to go to in order to stop the rise of Islam and the Sharia. The group in question, Muslims Against Crusades, announced a campaign to bring the Sharia to the doorsteps of London, Paris, Brussels and Rome. In the light of the atrocity in Norway, many might consider this campaign to be inflammatory. It's been running for several weeks, with dozens of stickers and posters appearing on lampposts in boroughs across East London with large Muslim populations, which read, You are entering a Sharia-controlled zone. Islamic rules enforced. These posters, these yellow Sharia control zone posters are all over Stratford. I've seen them on lampposts. It says you are entering a Sharia control zone. The police and the local council, Newham Council, are busy taking them down as fast as they can go up. Alan Craig is a long-term resident and former councillor in Newham, one of the boroughs in which the stickers and posters appeared. In his blog, Alan's Angle, he has written regularly about the spread of Islamism in East London from a Christian point of view. People are feeling very intimidated, but they sit here and they say there's going to be no gambling, no alcohol, no music or concerts, no porn or prostitution, no drugs or smoking. Islamic rules enforced in this Sharia control zone, that's what they're saying. I mean, it's clearly deliberately provocative. Mr Craig isn't the only one who thinks the campaign is divisive. Lutfur Rahman is the mayor of nearby Tower Hamlets, one of the boroughs in which the stickers have been appearing. It is deplorable the people who have stuck those posters on our streets, on our lampposts, is deplorable. I can assure you we are a community that what we're interested in is leading a decent life, a normal life. Those kind of behaviour, those kind of fringe behaviour, extremist behaviour are unacceptable in my borough. We condemn and we will not accept this kind of posters, these kind of fringe elements within our community. Have you been I, taking the posters down? Uh, uh, well, absolutely, absolutely. When, I, when we've heard Officers know, we know that kind of behaviour is unacceptable and I hope the police service takes uh, note of this and catches the culprits who advocate this kind of message, intolerant message in this community. One of the people behind the poster campaign is the hardline cleric Anjem Chowdhury, an Islamist involved with the banned groups Al Mujahiroon and Islam for UK. He's now associated with Muslims Against Crusades. Mr Chowdhury is careful to point out that while he is the spokesman for the stickers and posters, he does not put them up himself. We have an obligation, in fact, to enforce as much of the Sharia as we are capable of doing. So if we can run the prostitution out of the streets, the kind of drugs and alcohol and thug life and the danger that we face at the current time for our elderly, our youth and even our women, 
you know, out of areas which are heavily Muslim populated, then I think that's a great thing. I think many non-Muslims would agree with that. Stickers is as part of the program. It also involves a heavy awareness campaign, leafleting, pamphleting, distribution, talks and conferences, demonstrations and processions in most of the heavily populated Muslim areas. But at the moment, you have no authority to enforce these Sharia zones. We don't need authority from uh, people. The land belongs to God. He is the one who gives us the legislation. We are the people who are responsible to implement it on this earth. Many argue that these stickers are deliberately provocative, that it stirs up a lot of resentment in the area from non-Muslims, and that you're trying to stir up trouble. The mayor of Tower Hamlets, the borough we're standing in now, told me he thought they were deplorable. Well, you know, it's a very mayor that allows all night drinking and uh, gambling. The fact that we have stickers, we say no prostitution, no gambling, no drugs, etc. And we're trying to weed those out of society and we're saying, look, Sharia is better. We're going to enforce it as much as we can. We're not promising violence. We're not saying that we're going to grab people physically and kidnap them. I don't think it's anything to be afraid of. But some people are afraid of the spread of Islam. A YouGov poll last June, for example, showed that 58% of Britons associated Islam with extremism. Sharia zones have no legal standing under the law of the land, whatever Mr Chowdhury, who is regularly described as a hate preacher by the press, says. However, while the fear of Islam remains just that for many, in pockets with large Muslim populations, the argument has more resonance. Alan Craig, who ran for Mayor of London as leader of the Christian People's Alliance, says the stickers are simply the latest sign of what he sees is creeping Islamization. I've lived in England all my life, an Englishman. I've lived here for 30 years. I can no longer walk out of my house by conventional meat. It is almost impossible to get around here. Yes, sir, I've, I go to Sainsbury's or one of the national chains, but apart from that, I have to buy halal if I want to eat around, buy uh, locally. But beyond halal meat, what actual evidence is there of this creeping Islamization? My nearest bus stop, which is about 200 metres away from here, where we sit today, is regularly spray-painted with black paint whenever a model advertising swimwear or advertising underwear comes on there. She is spray-painted, and it's happened to a number of the bus stops around here. But she isn't just spray-painted to cover up her body. The ominous thing is, of course, they cover her face as well. They paint a burqa onto her. Well, again, it's not the end of the world, like halal meat isn't the end of the world, but it's just another sign of what is going on in our area around here. On the face of it, all that might not sound too serious. But in some densely Muslim parts of East London, there have been attempts to mete out what might be termed Sharia street justice. In one case, an Asian woman who worked in a pharmacy in Tower Hamlets and is not a practising Muslim was repeatedly harassed and then allegedly threatened with violent reprisals by Muslim men for failing to dress modestly. In May, four Muslim men were jailed for beating religious studies secondary school teacher Gary Smith with a Stanley knife, a metal rod and a brick simply because they objected to him teaching Muslim girls at school. These are maps they printed off the internet and they show the number of gay bars and the locations of them in East London uh, in 1991 and in 2011. In 1991, that there were 15 gay bars in the area around Shoreditch and Mile End and between Hackney Road and Commercial Road. And if we look at 2011, there are now only five gay bars. James, who doesn't want us to use his surname, is a gay man who has lived in East London, including Tower Hamlets, for 20 of the last 25 years. During that time, he says that gay people felt growing hostility from Muslims, leading to the closure of numerous gay and lesbian bars, and he claims, to an exodus of the local gay population. Gay people have left the area because we are scared of Islam. We've been told for the last 20 years that there are uh, Islamic fundamentalists who want to see us dead. Uh, and we see the spread of Islamic fundamentalism through Tower Hamlets. So we obviously don't want to live near people who want to see us dead. We've had various severely violent incidents against gay people in that area, and these incidents are often not reported by the national media. In some of these incidents, people have been, been almost murdered, and the, the stories have just not gone reported. One of my friends, who still lives in Tower Hamlets and refuses to admit that there is a problem, with Islam and their attitudes towards homosexuality. He himself was walking back from a gay bar with another man and walked through a park where there were a gang of Muslims and they just started to attack them. Do you feel safe as a gay man living among a large 
Muslim population in, in Tower Hamlets. I don't feel safe and we feel under siege because 10 to 20 years ago, we would not only do we have lots of gay bars around, we actually used to see gay people on the streets and we had neighbours who were gay. But what we've seen is the degaying of Tower Hamlets. Metropolitan police figures appear to bear out James's sense of a community under siege. Latest figures show that homophobic crime in Tower Hamlets rose by a fifth year on year to June, while many other boroughs showed a decrease. We don't know the religion of the perpetrators. All this has driven James, who says he's liberal and anti-fascist, to support the English Defence League, a street protest movement opposed to the spread of radical Islam. Critics accuse it of protesting against all Muslims. But James says he knows many other gay men who have joined and maintains it's not a racist organisation. When I first saw the EDL was starting to protest against things, I thought maybe this was a, a Nazi group or a racist group. So I did my research to find out more about them. And when I found out that there were black people involved and Asians involved, I decided that this was something that I could actually physically get involved with and find out more on a personal level. Experts, the police, even the Prime Minister, describe the EDL as an extremist group, as a, as a far-right group. But you don't sympathise with the far-right, so why are you supporting them? The EDL is a broad church. There are anarchists in the EDL, there are left-wing people in the EDL, there are right-wing people in the EDL, there are those in the middle. The Liberals and the left, they're the ones who should have led the opposition to Islamic extremism in Britain, um, but they dropped the ball. And now the ball's been taken up by a group of working class people who've never had much political involvement, don't particularly want to be involved in demonstrations and political actions, but they've realised that no one else is going to do this but them, so they will continue with it and it will not stop. We're outraged by what's going on down there. When you're outraged in a democracy, you protest. You get out on the street, you use your democratic right to protest over it. The EDL spokesman who calls himself Tommy Robinson, which isn't his real name. He claims his group has 100,000 online supporters, angry that they're not being listened to by the authorities. This is a dangerous scenario I'm talking about. Unless you give a platform to people's angers and frustrations, then it can go any way, really. You can't keep suppressing people's thoughts. And a lot of these angers and frustrations and worries and concerns about what's happening to our country, what's happening in our communities, they need to be aired. And you need to give people a platform to talk about them. So how serious a threat do groups like the EDL pose to public order? Douglas Murray of the Henry Jackson Society, which describes itself as a non-partisan think tank, says he warned around the time of 7-7 of the consequences of the failure of mainstream politics to get to grips with the rise of radical Islam, and groups like al Mujahirun in particular. I had predicted for a long time that something like the EDL would happen. It was perfectly obvious. al Mujahirun which is a group that's now been banned, was repeatedly having protests in Britain, which were being, quite rightly, considered news by the press, and were reporting them, and nothing was happening. Absolutely nothing was being done about it. Now, for commentators like me, it, it, it's all very well to say, um, this is an outrage, this is appalling, because I, I have a voice. Other journalists and commentators have a, have a voice. Politicians have a voice. But it was noticeable how few, relatively few people were using them. And the problem that always occurred to me was, what will, if there is no political reaction to this, what will ordinary people think and do about it? I've said for years now that there was one particular risk we had if decent, mainstream, centre-ground European political parties did not respond to the undeniable rise of Islamist extremism in Europe, and that was that if they did not in a mainstream and decent way address it, it would be addressed by people who were not decent, whom who were not mainstream. And I think to an extent, that's what started to happen. Luton, Bedfordshire, is the EDL's birthplace. The scene of a major march of 1,500 of their supporters through the city centre earlier this year and home to a large Muslim population. It's also well known for its links to a number of terrorist plots by Islamic extremists. The town is about two-thirds white and the EDL's vociferous protests have made it another community relations trouble spot. 
They wouldn't come for morning prayer at four o'clock and they found the two windows were smashed. That one door is totally smashed. So the window just ahead of us now was smashed? Yeah, that one is smashed. Last month, worshippers of the town's Oak Road Mosque awoke to find their building vandalised and the letters EDL spray-painted alongside a shvastika. The imam, Shahid Ahmed. Here, it was written here, EDL here. Uh, so so the, written down here. the letters EDL were written painted, on the... Painted or sprayed some, something, EDL here. And this, another window was broken yeah. on the other side. Uh, there was a, a written down here, EDL, EDL, and others. And it's also here, here, it was written EDL, EDL stuff. Mr Ahmed called for calm, worried that some members of his community might retaliate. Basically, when they have people seen in the morning, they're written down in the wall, the EDL. They start thinking about that it is done by EDL. They said, why they do it, they should not do it. Then told people not to react because we don't know who actually did it and police investigating. The, the fact that you had to call for calm, does that mean you were worried that there was going to be a reaction from members of your community? Some people can react badly or some people say, OK, let us do a demonstration in Luton. You know, the local authority is involved and they are investigating the matter. And they, if they sol solve the problem, we don't need to do anything. And uh, we are happy while the local authority is uh, taking the actions. This incident was the latest in a spate of cases in Luton, which occurred in February after the EDL demonstration. It's not clear who was behind them. The police say there is no evidence linking the criminal damage to the EDL. Even so, some have accused the group of intimidating Muslims in the town. Meanwhile, the EDL's Tommy Robinson says troublemakers are using their name to ignite tensions. I sat down with the police and said this is going to get real out of control here because it's going to work out tit for tat. Someone's trying to spark a war in Luton. And then every Muslim thinks we've gone and attacked well, if, if, if it wasn't you, if it wasn't, wasn't your supporters... It wasn't. And so when I was telling the police, you, I don't think you understand, because a lot of the time they're out of touch. So you don't understand what's going to go on in Luton. This is going to be all over world news, because it's going to be a war. There's going to be a riot going on, big time. In three weeks, the EDL will turn their attention from Luton to London's Tower Hamlets, a borough with a growing Muslim population, through which the group claims it will march with 1,500 of its supporters to the dismay of many local residents. And to introduce chaos and fear that we will not tolerate fascism and racism. Today we stand together once more against the threat of the media. In the London Muslim Centre, some several hundred, mostly Muslim people, have gathered. On their website, the EDL declare this a march into the lion's den. Provocative language, says the borough's independent mayor, Lutfor Rahman. Wherever they have gone, it has been clearly demonstrated. It is about provoking a section of the community, the Muslim community. It is about targeting a community. It's about dividing and sowing the seed of division in that community. In Tamlitz, we have a strong community relationship. As the mayor of this borough, for me, the oneness, the one Tamlitz is more important. And the fringe mad elements are not welcome in my borough. It's certainly true that several EDL demos have descended into street fighting and standoffs. Scores of its supporters have been arrested on demos, 140 at least. Last time the EDL threatened to hold a demonstration in Tower Hamlets in June 2010, groups of Muslim youths ran riot through the streets. Anjem Chowdhury of Muslims Against Crusades, who teaches Sharia law around the corner from East London Mosque in Tower Hamlets, expects the same response to the EDL next month. Well, I think it's extremely foolish of them to come to Town Hamlets because, you know, this is a very, very densely populated Muslim area and the youth are already formed into many gangs which are completely out of control. I don't think that they will be able to march through Town Hamlets without there being a significant clash with the local youth, at least, and the Muslim community. But at the same time, you know, that if you're attacked, you know, we're not like the Christians, that if you hit me on the right cheek, I'm going to give you my left cheek. If you take my jumper, I'll give you my trousers. So I think ultimately they have a right to defend themselves. But at the same time, I don't think they should initiate any kind of violence and they should be engaged in dialogue. But I don't think they should be cowards. If they're attacked, they have a right to defend themselves. So far, the government has said it won't ban the march, although Communities Minister Eric Pickles has described the EDL as vile. The EDL told the report that they're not trying to provoke a fight, simply to exercise their democratic right to march through the borough. Spokesman Tommy Robinson. This is what we always hear. Muslim youth are going to riot, you can't do this. Let's look at the reasons why people are concerned. They're not concerned about what we're going to do. 
They're concerned to what the Islamic community are going to do. So I don't care if you need to get the army on the streets. This is our democratic right to protest over these issues. But previous demonstrations have spiralled into violence. I mean, is that your intention? No, our intention is completely opposite, to be honest. We just want to come and march. Let us march in, let us give our speeches, let us march out. That's all we're asking. I talk to people in every town and city in this country now who are in working class communities and there's a lot of anger out there, man. There's a real lot of anger. We're trying to do our best to, to harness it and direct it and show people the right way. And the government really needs to get a grip on it and realise it, which they're not. They're so far out of touch, they just don't understand. I've said that for the last two years in speeches, up on stages and in interviews. I've said, you're going to create English bombers. You're going to create English suicide bombers. In the wake of the atrocity in Norway, much has been made of Breivik's claims of links to the EDL. Yet beside the bravado, what is the evidence that the EDL supporters will turn to anything more than street scuffles and heckling? The National Domestic Extremism Unit and the Association of Chief Police Officers weren't available to be interviewed. So we asked Detective Superintendent Neil Malkin of Durham Police, who led a recent investigation into one of Britain's most dangerous far-right plots. My understanding of VDL is one of, they would take to the streets, they would engage in public demonstration. I have no evidence to suggest that they would take it to that next level. And it is very much vocal activity, albeit organised, and they do come together from around the country. But I have no evidence to suggest that they have gone that extra step further. How worried should we be by the EDL? From a policing perspective, we have what the EDL are doing well covered. We are monitoring activity, we are gathering intelligence on a daily basis. I'm comfortable that we are ensuring that there is no immediate threat from the EDL which would cause this country any significant harm. But while the EDL is not currently considered a terrorist threat, we've been told so-called lone wolves on the far right are. Before the last election, the British National Party appeared to be a growing political force. Their wipeout at the ballot box was met with celebration by many. However, some experts say it left BNP activists committed to far-right ideology without a political home. Matthew Goodwin is a social scientist from Nottingham University. The right wing of British politics has really undergone a process of fragmentation over the last few years. In fact, I can't recall any point in British history when the right wing has been so cluttered. Beyond the BNP, there are groups such as the National Front, the English Defence League, British Freedom, England First, Democratic Nationalists, English Democrats, and then you move into your groups like your Combat 18s, your Blood and Honours, your Racial Volunteer Force, your Aryan Strike Force. And I think there are good reasons for the security services and local authorities and government agencies to be watching how this movement evolves very carefully, because there is some evidence that showed that where you don't have a successful far-right party, levels of racially and religiously motivated violence tend to be higher. If al-Qaeda, or Islamist-inspired terrorism, for which about 140 people have been convicted in Britain, is set aside, the evidence suggests that the threat comes from the most extreme, neo-Nazi end of the far-right spectrum. Over the last 10 years, about a dozen people, mostly white supremacists, have been convicted for terrorism-related offences. The RSS feed, uh, you can subscribe to, say, as many blogs as you like. You, you get up in the morning, you open up your feed reader, and there's all this stuff in front of you. Uh, you could then choose to solely read those things every day and to completely ignore any other kind of media. I think it's far- Edmund Standing is a blogger who writes about the far right and Islamism. Last year, he co-authored Blood and Honour, Britain's far right militants. While monitoring a group called Aryan Strike Force, he came across a father and son team from County Durham, Ian and Nikki Davison. The Davisons were running Wolfpack, an internet forum. You can see they're becoming steadily more extreme. We have general discussion posts on Wolfpack here. It says, let's all think, do we want our children to be black, mixed race Jews? Do we want our grandchildren to live under Muslim shite rule? Well, do we? I don't, so what are you going to do? First response, kill, 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 before we let that happen. Some of the ideas that they're sharing is actually talking about forensic science and how to avoid being caught when you've been, as it puts, playing with substances. So it, it's not just a case of ideological radicalisation in this case, it's, it's the whole spectrum, it's including how to actually carry out attacks and how to even avoid the police catching you. It turned out that Mr Standing was not the only one monitoring them. 
Detective Superintendent Neil Malkin of Durham Police, who led a recent investigation into the Davisons, said police surveillance revealed an organised, highly motivated group. They had a structure around core group people, so we were aware of this sort of organisation, but their military precision was around their training camp development. We had footage of them in Cumbria, where they got into combat fatigues, disguising who they were to avoid being identified. And in early January uh, into February 2009, became aware of not just the training camp video, but also the pipe bombs and there was a number of pipe bombs had been exploded and that's when I started to put the planning in place to arrest him in the June. One thought process they had was to poison a Muslim water supply and they'd looked into how they could make that effective. They'd also looked at um, the developments of what they called an electronic or magnetic pulse bomb which was designed to put peer to electronic devices so thereby disrupting a means of people for, to communicate. So they had looked at sophisticated methods of attack. With a highly toxic ricin factory found in Ian Davison's home, with enough doses to kill up to 15 people, Neil Malkin says he has no doubt that the Davisons were extremely dangerous. The pair were convicted in 2010. Two other far-right terrorist plotters in 2009 and 2008, respectively, included Muslims among their list of possible targets. Although it's hard to gather evidence, there is mounting concern about the potential for further violence from within these sorts of groups. Matthew Goodwin. In 2009, both the London Metropolitan Police and the Department of Homeland Security warned about the growing threat of violence from within right-wing movements, and I'm talking about movements to the right beyond centre-right political parties. At the same time in Britain, we've seen cases in recent years of what you might call want-to-be lone wolves, guys who have been stockpiling explosives or engaging in politically motivated violence. Now, a few weeks ago, if you pointed to these cases and raised the threat of violence from within the far right, many would have said, well, you're being alarmist, you're being speculative. I think after Norway now, I think there is a realisation that this movement clearly has the potential for violence. And there are a number of cases that we can point toward, thankfully cases which didn't prove successful, but cases that we can point towards when making that case to look at this more seriously. Fear of Islamization, however real or fanciful, has breathed new life into militant groups on Britain's extreme right. When David Cameron's review of terrorist threats reports back, a new far right with an anti-Muslim agenda may well require more and serious attention.